Hello, everyone. I am here with 2020 congressional candidate from New Jersey's 8th congressional district. His name is Hector Oseguera, and he's running against Albio Sierras, and he's here to talk about his campaign. Hector, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you for having me on. Really happy to talk to you. Yeah, you're the third, uh, I want to say politician from New Jersey who I have interviewed and all of them have been recommended by Russ here in Sione. So shout out to him also was on the program as well. So um, yeah. your history is very interesting. Um, you're you're a millennial and you kind of follow this political trajectory where in 2014 you volunteered for Elizabeth Warren's senatorial campaign, 2016 Bernie's presidential campaign, 2018 AOC's congressional campaign, and now you're running yourself in 2020. So I, as someone who would never want to run for Congress, I view this as like tremendous self-sacrifice. So what made you want to step up and run for Congress? Because I think this is something that is uh, is very noble considering I, I, I just would find it horrible to do. <laughs> Well, I really appreciate that. And like I said, thank you for having me on. What really made me want to run is sort of this political awakening. I've been interested in politics my whole life. I was a poli-sci major and public policy is always something that I've really cared about. And I come from a poor immigrant community. So there are a lot of issues that are constantly on the forefront with us, not just immigration, but wages, uh, labor rights a whole host of issues that are always affecting the community. Gun violence is big where I live. And I think it's just time for people who are sick and fed up with this system to step up and do something about it. Uh, I live in an area that's 100 percent Democrats, almost completely run by Democrats. And so for a long time, a lot of people were sort of complacent and thought that everything was OK, right? Because even if national politics are sort of screwed up, we have all these Democrats and they'll protect us. But what started happening with me is I started digging into our local politicians and I started coming up against these really bad horror stories. So my opponent, Albio Sierras, he was my hometown mayor. I was raised in the smallest city in America. It's called West New York, New Jersey. Right. And that is because we are directly west of Manhattan. It is a one square mile city. And my congressman had activists go to his office when the ICE detention centers were making headlines. And these activists made a very pragmatic ask of him. They said, would you uh, at least vote to rein in ICE spending, right? And I'm telling you, this is a heavily Democratic district, mostly immigrant, mostly Hispanic, right? So what do you think someone like that would say, right? They'd be like, okay, sure. He says, absolutely not. He says, ICE does great work, and I will never vote to cut a single dollar from ICE. That's his response to activists asking him in the height of the Im Immigrant Detention Center crisis. That's his response to the activists. And so the more I dug into it, the more horror stories I came up with about my congressman. And I just decided that it's about time. He didn't have a primary challenger in 2018, so I didn't want this election cycle to go by and for people to feel like this guy's doing such a great job that he doesn't even deserve a challenge. So that's really what made me want to run and to run against him specifically. Yeah, that's that's a really great thing to say. A lot of people like in Congress, they they become complacent. They hold fewer and fewer town halls as the years go by. And people just get comfortable. You think, oh, well, it's a Democrat, so they're going to represent me. But I mean, for someone like that to I mean, for one, I think that every single politician should commit to wanting to abolish ICE. But if you can't at a minimum admit to like cutting funds to ICE, you're irredeemable, like your career should be over. So I'm so glad that you stepped up. Like I always like whenever somebody comes on, I thank them for running for Congress because it's just such it's such a huge thing to do to put yourself through to kind of sacrifice your time when, you know, you're you're a regular working American. So it, it's difficult to find yeah. time to do this, but we have to have people step up. Politicians have gone on for too long, haven't been checked. And I'm so glad that people across the country are, you know, just rising up and they're finally challenging them because these Democrats, 
they benefited from having a D in front of their names and they just kind of felt comfortable. But now I think that they're learning. We're not going to just accept the status quo. We're not going to accept, you know, you barely representing your district and keeping that seat warm. It's unacceptable. So I'm, I'm so glad that people are starting, starting to finally like rise up. So I want to learn a little bit about yourself because you have a really robust campaign. Um, I've said this before. A lot of uh, congressional candidates have better campaigns than the people running for president. Um, a lot of people running for president. Yours is no different, of course. Um, so I wanted you to talk through your campaign. And on top of that, I wanted you to talk a little bit about yourself because you have like this typical millennial story that I feel like really resonates with people, myself included, um, because you, you graduated law school and you couldn't find a job. You had to work at five guys. Thankfully, you ended up getting a job. You're currently an anti-money laundering specialist. So just tell us a little bit about yourself and um, a little bit about your platform as well and kind of like how your personal story influenced your current platform, because I always think that that's really interesting. Yeah, so I think all these things tie in together. So let's just start with uh, the lack of representation, right? My congressman, he has never held a single town hall and is never going to hold one. That's his stated stance. So that is off the rip. One of the things that really gets my blood boiling about the lack of representation, right? So I grew up in this town and New Jersey behaves like a bunch of little kingdoms. There are all these fiefdoms where you have a county boss who controls everything from the Board of Education up to the senator, right? And I grew up in this system and everybody's a Democrat, so you sort of assume everything's okay. I go away to college and I go, I went to BU and I start meeting all these leftists and I start getting involved in sort of progressive politics and learning a lot more. I eventually found my way to law school, like you said, and yeah, I come out of law school and the job market is crappy. So what ends up happening is I have to pay for rent. I have needs that need to be fulfilled. So yeah, what do I do? I had to take a job at Five Guys. I'm flipping burgers with uh, you know, a JD. And like you said, that's a kind of typical millennial story. Being Hispanic and sort of like being from this blue collar community. My dad was a blue collar worker his whole life. He was a truck driver. He was a taxi cab driver. He did. He was a plumber. He was a handyman. He did every blue collar job under the sun. And so I've never had this sort of like elitist, oh, well, I have a degree, so I can't do that, right? Like, that's just not in my reality. That's not in my work ethic. So when time got hard, I had to get to doing things. And I took a job at Five Guys. You know, I'm flipping burgers for a few months, and eventually I was able to find a job. How I ended up in anti-money laundering is that while I was in law school, I had this wonderful professor. Her name is Elizabeth Spawn. And I really owe everything to her. Professor Spawn, if you're listening, I love you. You are the reason I'm here today. And she actually ha is on a list in China. Whenever she goes to China, she's followed around by their government because she's heavy into the anti-corruption space. She does a lot of writing about uh, anti-corruption and anti-money laundering in general. And what I came to see is that corruption is the sort of in the backdrop of all the issues that affect us. If you're talking about uh, health care, if you're talking about education, if you're talking about the war machine, there's always this person in the background who's pulling these strings and the strings are always money. It's, it's always money and it's never legitimate money. It's always money that they've stolen either or gained illegitimately. And now in their quest, to make that money look legitimate, they engage in all these corrupt activities that end up really hurting working class people like me and like the people in my community. So one of the key pillars of our platform is affordable housing, right? Why is it so hard to find affordable housing where I live in Hudson County or in New York City, right? What you have is all these developments going up. These real estate developers are putting up these high rises, these luxury high rises, and they cost so much, right? So I'm an attorney, right? I tend to be doing better than the average person just because of the position that I hold. And even I could absolutely never afford one of these high rises, one of these condos. No way in hell could I afford these things. So who's affording these things, right? You have all these investors coming in. There was a scandal with Trump uh, bringing, pay, paying, I think it was about a half a million dollars to get these investors coming in from China. You have a lot of uh, corrupt people trying to bring their money into the United States. And so what they'll do is they'll buy up all these high rises 
they'll buy up all these condos. Nobody lives there, but nobody cares because all the right people are getting paid off. So affordable housing is because of corruption. If you go into healthcare, the insurance industries, it's because of corruption. If you go into almost any issue that progressives are talking about today, immigration, uh, labor rights, any issue that you go into, you eventually come up with a guy with a ton of money who's trying to hide it. And that's so interesting. And I'm glad that you have this background. Like, I'm never someone on my show, my audience knows this, who will, you know, command that anyone running for Congress have, like, the right type of experience and whatnot. But I think that it's so neat that you're an anti-money laundering specialist because you kind of see, like, a behind the, you know, the curtain look that we all don't really get to see. Like, you understand all of these underlying mechanisms that lead to corruption. And I think that probably arms you with more knowledge than most people in Congress going in to be able to take on these crooks, which I think is great. So um, I kind of want to expand the conversation. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your worldview. Very, very big question. But generally speaking, like, let's say you're elected to Congress. Um, what would you hope to fix? Are we looking at structurally, uh, short term, long term? Like, what do you want to accomplish, let's say, within your first term? And what are like, long term goals that you think the left can and should accomplish? Great question. So there are a couple big ticket items like uh, Medicare for All that I would jump right onto. So Pramila Jayapal's bill and Bernie Sanders' bill is something that I would start pushing day one. We're going to get that passed in my first term. Beyond that, now that we're talking up on the anti-money laundering stuff, I would be really big on a 21st century Glass-Steagall Act, a 21st century antitrust act, Antitrust was one of those really important classes that I took in law school that, again, gives you that uh, behind the curtain look at what are these mega corporations doing in the background that is so anti-competitive, right? So America is supposed to be this capitalist bastion, free markets, right? But what you don't see, what you don't hear that much about is all the monopoly power that exists in our economy, which actually makes it not really much of a free market at all. We're actually living under a bunch of corporate fiefdoms, uh, corporate masters who are heavily invested in not having any competition in their market because that'll mess up their bottom line. It's the same thing with healthcare, right? Why is there only a few insurance companies? When you look at the insurance market, what you have is a bunch of state by state monopolies, which is the reason why we can't get affordable healthcare in this country. It's one of the big reasons. So a 21st century Glass-Steagall, um, I'm really interested in the Stock Act, the Stop Trading on Congressional Knowledge Act, um, because what you also end up seeing is a lot of politicians will go into Congress and they will start regulating an industry, right? Now, lo and behold, the day that they leave Congress, they will go into being a lobbyist for that very same industry. So John Boehner, I think, is the best example. He was essentially the tobacco industry's congressman. As soon as he left Congress, he became the tobacco industry's lobbyist. So that's something that we really need to cut back on, like 100%. Um, you have a lot of things very similar to that, not quite as blatant, but someone with my background definitely has the tools to by the sort of lobbyist powers because, you know, publicly funded elections is another one. I'm basically trying to get the money out of politics, I guess, is the big banner you could put that under. But that comes under a lot of shapes and sizes, depending on whether we're talking about electoral politics or whether we're talking about, you know, in the legislative act of being uh, in Congress. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, because the way that you break down like corruption and the way it works, it's really simplistic and it helps people like me understand. Like I have a very broad sense of like what to look for, but you kind of really know all of the intricacies and nuances of it. So when you talk to people, you know, when you're knocking on doors and whatnot, what's the response? Because whenever you see like a populist type of campaign in any country, not just the US, anti-corruption is usually like at the top of their agenda because people around the world see that global capitalism has corrupted a lot of institutions everywhere. And I would imagine that the response to that especially knowing who the incumbent is currently, it's got to be like, you've got to be making a lot of people, you know, uh, want to jump on board with your campaign, right? Like, what's the response? 
Yeah, well, you know, you're not going to make a lot of news talking about corruption in New Jersey, right? It's sort of like a running <laughs> joke that New Jersey is like politically corrupt. And there is so much we could touch upon in that regard, specifically with my district, right? So one quick story I'll tell you about is that, um, like I said, the part of New Jersey where I exist is run like a bunch of fiefdoms. And my congressman basically has goes down the line. The line is something that we probably will talk about. It's a mechanism that the establishment uses to perpetuate itself in New Jersey. But essentially what you have is that these higher end politicians, your senators, your congressmen, will go down to the local level, the police, the firefighters, the teachers, the crossing guards, and they basically make them feel as if they are only in their position because that politician sort of pitied them and gave them a job, right? And so you find a lot of local teachers who, you know, get into it for all the right reasons. They love children, they want to teach. And then a couple months into their job, they'll come to find out that they have to go canvassing for their local politician. Not kidding. And these sorts of things constantly repeat themselves throughout New Jersey politics. Uh, these are mechanisms that the establishment uses to continually perpetuate themselves. So the response is amazing because people know what's going on. It's, it's like an open secret, right? Everybody knows what these politicians do. There was a story that broke not that long ago about people in a town in my district where the local party boss had people who lived in different towns, had moved away years ago, but still maintained an address in that town and they would come back and vote there. They lived, they usually had another address somewhere else in the district. They'd go there and vote as well. So there are all these like really small, like insidious and hard to know about mechanisms that the politicians use to perpetuate themselves and to keep themselves in office. And a lot of people are really sick of it. It's not a secret. Everybody knows about it, and a lot of people are just sick of that, and they are ready for change. The reception has been tremendous. Every single day, I've got my DMs are blowing up with people like, oh, my God, I can't believe someone's really going to challenge the boss, because that's, that's essentially who I'm challenging. I'm challenging the county boss, and, you know, it's a great risk. Nobody thinks that anyone would ever do something like this. So just the fact that someone's doing it, the reception is really good. That's awesome. I See, and I think that it resonates with people because for members of Congress, there's this sense of entitlement. Like, they are the ones who are elected there, and if you want to be the next person, you've got to wait your turn, you've got to pull all the right strings, get to know all the right people, and it's so frustrating. And to see someone kind of like buck that type of orthodoxy if you will it's really nice um so i want to ask you because you you kind of touched on something that i think makes up a lot of the issues that M americans have with congress so people don't want to take action that help them get elected so an example is health care of course you know a lot of democrats and republicans but democrats specifically who don't support medicare for all they take money from private health insurers big pharma and then in turn they don't yep. support policies like medicare for all and this yeah. is specifically because you know if they support that policy then all that donations go away and that reduces the chance that they get elected because if you want to get elected in america or re-elected you need money so my question for you is strategically speaking how do you convince them if that's even possible like do you think you can basically put democrats in a headlock you know your colleagues if you get elected and get them to come on board with policies like medicare for all or do you actually have to support primary challenges like what do you think is the best way because i kind of feel like it's in you know all a kitchen sink approach let's do all of that but i don't necessarily know what will actually be conducive to victory so what's kind of your plan going in Okay, so I kind of shy away from what's conducive to victory because nobody knows what's going to win here, right? We yeah. have to do everything we can. So I support all the primary challengers. You mentioned the other New Jersey uh, primary challengers that you had uh, on, Russ and Zena, who I know well and who I'm completely behind. But yes, uh, when we're in office, we do have to, so this is from my anti-corruption career, but you have to name and shame them, right? Yeah. So we have to say, this person is taking money from this industry. A great one from New Jersey is somebody who's running for president, Cory Booker. 
someone who I don't support personally because he takes a ton of money from the pharmaceutical industry. And that's been well known in Jersey for a very long time. So, yeah, you have to name and shame them. You have to say this person takes money from this industry and that's why they won't vote the way that they should. Yeah. And I love that naming and shaming. I think it's important. And the reason why like we don't see more of that is because like nobody can really name and shame in Congress because they're all corrupt. Like AOC. Yeah, they're all doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah AOC can name and shame. But like if you're let's yeah. say you're in Congress and you're Donald Norcross, another corrupt politician uh -huh. from New Jersey, oh. he can't. Who is he going to name and shame? Because he's just as corrupt as everyone else. So. Yeah, it's... Yeah, he's going to name him himself. <laughs> exactly. So it's like, this is why nothing is getting done, because they're all bought and paid for, albeit, you know, maybe yeah. from different industries and whatnot. But nobody wants to, you know, call out corruption, because if you're participating yeah. in it, then you're a hypocrite and you don't want to, that to get turned around on you. So it's frustrating. So this is why I think, like, for the first time, I feel like cautiously optimistic. I stress the cautious, because so many people are like standing up and running for Congress. Like, I remember back in 2016, when I just started of the humanist report i could count like the number of progressives primarying uh other democrats like on one hand now it's impossible to keep track and i've brought on like almost 30 people on the program including yourself now so it's it's so exciting because it feels like finally there's this sense that america is waking up um but my question to you is and this is something that i genuinely don't know the answer to how do we keep the movement sustained? I oftentimes try to like come up with these good hypotheticals. Like, you know, let's say Bernie's elected and you're in Congress. What can we achieve? But I kind of want to get a little bit grim for a moment, if you'll if you'll indulge. Yeah. Um, so let's Ooh. say the worst case scenario happens. Um, let's say that yeah. we lose in 2020 and Trump is reelected. How do we yeah. keep the movement like galvanized? Because that's one thing that I'm worried about. Like demoralization and just apathy and cynicism it makes it really difficult like it's a huge barrier and i don't think that people talk about yeah. that enough so how do you keep this momentum going even if it feels like you know the situation is hopeless just from your experience because you're an organizer you're an activist so what would you say to that because i i genuinely don't know it's hard to like keep people um you know feeling encouraged on my show when it's like i report bad news after bad news after bad news so what do you, what would you say <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a very legit question. And I think what we're doing now is that we have a plan for the alternative, right? So, yeah, we're always planning for, yeah, 2020, Bernie gets elected. There's a progressive sweep of all Congress and we're all in office, right? But I think AOC is actually the model for this, is that when you're in that position of power, you don't let your foot off the gas we can't get complacent, right? Because in a lot of ways, complacency is what brought us Trump, right? All this complacency about the Obama years and sort of feeling like, oh, we won. We won the ide ideological war. The right has been defeated and, you know, rainbows and butterflies forever. That is what got us Trump because that opens the floodgates for people to organize and to fight back against us. So I think AOC and the squad in general, they are the model for what we're doing. They have not let their foot off the gas. They've been, you know, causing mayhem left and right, and we're loving it. And that's what we have to do, right? Worst case scenario, everybody loses 2020, Trump is reelected, worst case scenario, right? What we do is that we get out in the streets the very next day, we apply pressure, we make phone calls. You know, it, it's basically a continuation of the energy that's going on now because there is a tremendous amount of progressive energy out there and it's going to go somewhere in that worst case scenario, right? Those people are not going to just poof out of existence. They're going to be somewhere. They're going to have priorities. There are so many groups that I speak to on a daily basis that have been sort of doing this long slog for a long time when it's, I mean, if it's uh, domestic workers' rights, if it's gun violence, these are people that have been in the trenches fighting these fights for a long time with no fame and no glory and just the sweat on their brow and these little victories that they can pick together. So worst case scenario, talk to people in our communities and let them know that we're not going to go away because they're not going to go away. And these problems are not going to go away. So just applying the pressure and not letting your foot off the gas, I think, is the best sort of contingency plan. 
Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, it's um, it's easy to kind of see where we went wrong, at least for myself, because like you said, we were complacent after Obama, I think, generally speaking. M you know, for me, I was in college. I was working at Blockbuster and Subway while in college. And it's like, OK, he's elected. I could just kind of hang out now. But that's not really the way that politics yeah. works. That's not the way that change happens. And then you, you do kind of see, you know, these little windows of opportunity. We had the Occupy movement. And now with the Bernie Sanders movement, I think that what he created will persist throughout the years. I really do feel confident about that. Um, and like you said, it, it really, it comes down to leadership from progressives like AOC that we now have that we didn't really have before, um, who are very yeah. visible. And I think that really does make a difference. Like having people represent a movement, it does help. Um, so let me ask you this. By now, anyone who's watching is going to be convinced they're going to want to support you. So what can we do to make sure you are elected? Uh, give us your pitch and tell us what we can do and where to go. Well, if you want to support, you can go to my website, which is Osegera2020, my last name, Osegera2020.com. Um, please donate, sign up to volunteer. If you live in New Jersey, anywhere in New Jersey, specifically in my district, Please look me up. I'm very responsive on social media. Someone from my team will get back to you. We're, you know, this is going to be a push of all of us. So if you're interested, if you care about these issues, please sign up, donate, uh, sign up to volunteer, sign up to canvas with us. We'll be canvassing in Elizabeth on Saturday. We have a meet and greet in Weehawken next week. We're just, you know, really hitting the campaign trail hard. We're not going to leave this up to chance. This is a campaign to win. We're fighting to defeat the Democratic establishment. That is what this is about. And if that's something that people are interested in, I, you know, I will beg you to sign up, do anything you can to push this movement along. Absolutely. Well, we will leave that there. Hector, thank you so much for coming on the program. It's been a pleasure. We will be watching and rooting for you, man. Thank you so much, Mike. It's a pleasure.